Hi folks, welcome to Chris Goes Corner. Unfiltered commentary. And that's your truth, the real truth. Please like, share, and subscribe. And as always, thank you for your support. Welcome back. A little change of pace here for Chris Goes Corner. An interview with author Sarah A. Chrisman. She's the author of The Tales of Chetsamoka. It's a fictional series, seven parts, that takes place in the Pacific Northwest in the late 1800s, the Victorian era. It's a great, great, fascinating reading. She's a very good author, and we had a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. This is part three of three. I'll leave a link in the description to Sarah's Amazon page for her books, as well as a link to her YouTube channel. And I hope everyone reads Sarah's books and subscribes to her channel. Yeah, I um, I think, I know this is, all oh, the, the leftists will go crazy when I say this, but I think back then, man, men and women, they knew their roles in society. And some of them overlapped, to be sure. Um, mm -hmm. But there's nothing wrong with it. It's just a dynamic that they knew that, okay, uh, I own a business or I work somewhere and the wife takes care of the house and the kids. And, and it, it's not a, it's not a bad thing. It's just everybody knew what their job was. Right. And everybody knew what their strengths were. Yeah. And there's a wonderful etiquette guide from the 1890s where the etiquette between husbands and wives actually tells them to consult and advise together right. because they tell it specifically says to the husbands that your wife is your best advisor. And because there is this different perspective, there is this perspective of both the masculine and the feminine, and we need both of them. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. And it's something that I think we need to get back to. And I tell you the truth, honestly, the way things are going now, I think we will get back to it. I think it will get I so, hope so, I think it will get so bad. When I say bad, I mean, socially that things are so intertwined. Uh, you know, it's funny. I was watching uh, Jordan Peterson, he's a psychologist from Canada, and he was saying in the Scandinavian countries, where you can, as about as equal as men and women can get in society. I mean, it's, it's as far as you can go, that government can intervene. And they said the funny part was, the more the countries are equal, the more men and women pick different things. Mm -hmm. It was yeah, something that absolutely. they were just astounded, like 95% of the women there are nurses, and 95% of the men are engineers, and so all the, the social... Uh, professors are going, wait a minute, we didn't expect this, like, because people are people, and there'll always be people no matter where you live. Right, exactly. There was an essay written in the late 19th century where the writer is discussing the question, what is equality between the sexes? And he puts forth for the reader that it's a meaningless question because yeah. it's like asking, is the eye equal to the ear? Yeah, yeah. Because... You need both of them. Granted, there are people who are without sight or without hearing, but that is not something people aspire to. That's something that's seen as something they have to overcome. Yeah. And by all means, all the more power to them. I have profound respect well, for people who can overcome that sort well, of thing. It, it, it's funny. But, um, it's funny when he mentioned the different countries. They had like 30 countries on a list, maybe even 50. I forget how many. And they were figuring out the equality ratio. And of course, the Scandinavian countries were on top as the most equal, and they chose different things. But the funny part was, you know where men and women pick the same thing? Is in the poor yeah. countries. In the impoverished countries are the ones where men and women pick the same things. And he thought to myself, which way you want to go here, guys? You want to go in a Western uh, productive society, or do you want to live in some dirt shack somewhere where everybody's equal? And that's the choices. And it's in... It's really fascinating. I think younger people now are starting to understand, wait a minute, maybe everything we were told or everything we were read isn't 100% accurate, just like Sparks Prosper. It's just maybe some of it is propaganda. Maybe we ought to just take a breath to uh, be people. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that Felix confronts in Sparks Press is he's confronting all the yellow journalism right. that he's dealing with, all of this hyperbole, all of this false news, we would now say. And he decides that he refuses to feed into that. He refuses to contribute to that because he wants to make the world better. Uh, yeah, I know he was, uh, he touched on that a little bit. Uh, in the pre book previous to that, he's starting to be disillusioned a little bit, but he's basically 
it's a small town. There's not a lot of big jobs available. And you, know, you had mentioned maybe he was thinking about leaving, but I haven't gotten that far yet. I'm not going to tell you if I knew because I don't want to ruin it for people. But, but uh, yeah, it's it's funny. You go back and look on the Internet, and some of the newspaper articles, they were horrible. <laughs> they were, I mean, I'm not going to say the word, but, I mean, uh, Andrew Jackson's wife, I guess, thought she was divorced. This is in the 1840s. She thought she was divorced and come to find out her lawyer didn't file the paperwork properly when she married Andrew Jackson. So they used the W word and huge print on the top half of the fold concerning his wife. And it was horrible. You think it's bad now? It's 10 times worse back then. Mm. Well, there are, there's, there's plenty of, of, there's plenty of yellow journalism these days too. And plenty of false news out there too. And plenty of very insulting news out there too. Now, it's funny. Uh, it's funny. I was reading the other day, did you hear the website called the Babylon B? No. It's a website. It's hysterical. And they put really mm-hmm. outrageous stories. And they know they're not true. It's just for fun. Mm-hmm. I mean, so just outrageous stuff. I can't think of the top of my head, but about a couple of months ago, they had a print a retraction. Because one of the outrageous stories actually came true, and they apologized to the readers. <laughs> I thought that was great. They go, we're really sorry, but that was actually true, and we apologize. We'll try not to do that again. And I thought that was funny. <laughs> but uh, Well, there's a, you know, the old, I think it was Hearst who said, if it bleeds, it leads. Yeah. And that's still very much the, the attitude of a lot of modern media. <laughs> well, that just proves that people are people are people no matter what era it is. Uh, it's just different Absolutely. technology. Now we go for clicks, and back then they went for newspaper sales. Nothing really mm-hmm. has changed. Just as smart, and they're both good, and they're both just, just as bad as today. And that's something I think I try to tell some of the younger people that the average soldier in the Civil War or back in the 1880s was, was had the same feelings and the same hardships and the same wants and needs as everybody today, and they were just as smart as people today. Absolutely. And the fight for truth and honesty and what's right still goes on. Yeah. And yeah. we'll always be fighting it, but it's a good fight. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm delighted. I'm going to probably get most of Three Women a Wheel, which is number six in the series for those listening. Uh I'm going to find out what happens because I, I'm really eager to see what happens to the three ladies on their trip because they're in the barn, they're in the barn, they're in the barn right now. And the one lady spent too much money for the baby owl as the kids were torturing. So I'm, that's about where I'm at right now. So, <laughs> well, the, the story of the family they stayed with, the, again, that was a real family okay. out on Mount Rainier. So in Three Women a Wheel, three of our characters from Chetsamoka are taking a trip through the mountains to Longmire's Mineral Springs. And Longmire's Mineral Springs was a real hot spring up on Mount Rainier in Washington State that was a tourist attraction for people to come and take the waters. And on the way there, they, our characters, our friends, stop at the farmhouse of this man who everyone calls Indian Henry. And he was a real man, too. Okay. And the, the story about him is kind of interesting. The rec- the records, no one quite agrees on exactly which tribe he was from. There are different accounts. But what is agreed is that his own tribe kicked him out for killing a medicine man ah. uh, because the medicine man had failed to heal his father. Okay. Which, at that time in that culture, it was... It was something that was done. If a medicine man failed to heal someone, sometimes the medicine man would be killed. But at the same time, it was kind of becoming frowned upon. So his own tribe kicked him out and he moved up to the mountain and started a homestead. And then these other Indian women came along and he wound up with three wives and oh, yeah, they were yeah. all real, real I, people. Yeah, the ladies and, were outraged that he had three wives. I remember that. They were absolutely outraged, I remember. <laughs> well, Lizzie is. Addie is sort of understanding because Addie has lived in the town of Chetsamoka all her life. And her family is acquainted with Chief Chetsamoka, who, again, was a real historical man. And he did have two wives, Sihimitsum and Chilil. Right. And Addie's line to Lizzie is, where would the early settlers have been without them? Yeah. And Lizzie is a very prim school marm, and so she's she's just uncomfortable with the idea of staying with a man who's got three wives. But so this is uh, Spark. I want to go back to Sparks Press again. This is pretty much the journey that he takes as far as his journalistic career goes, and uh, uh-huh. what, he, what he does with it. And uh, I haven't read it yet, so no, I have I know absolutely zero about it except for the row in the back of the uh, cover. But 
<laughs> but, uh, Felix, he's pretty much fed up. And, yeah. And this is his way absolutely. of trying to, trying to keep his honor at the same time, and it's not easy. Right, absolutely. Because he sees himself turning in truthful pieces, and then by the time his editor gets done with them, he doesn't really recognize them anymore, and they're no longer the truth he had written. Yeah, what was that one headline the guy said in one of the videos I saw on YouTube? It says, uh, the CDC has, has discovered a cure for cancer. 300,000 cancer doctors out of work. You know, <laughs> that's what you're going to get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, part of it comes with it comes from just seeing seeing how things get twisted about very very simple things about myself. I've I've spoken with very nice journalists like yourself and some other sterling great journalists. I've spoken with other ones who by the time the story came to press, I wondered where on earth they got their ideas from. <laughs> yeah, no, I, because I know I saw the one video you had, I think it was the Seattle Times, where you were confronted <laughs> by women nose to nose, and it was most of the baby boomer women. And, and looking at myself, you know, wait a minute, isn't this supposed to be the, the generation that believed in everybody can do their own thing and everybody's free? And that, <laughs> but, just, but you only can do what I think is right. Right. And that's right. the part that, that I thought is just the most hypocritical thing. And I talk about that quite a bit in my uh, YouTube channel. But I'm really heavy handed, though. I, I don't I don't smooth <laughs> anything over. So, uh, in fact, in my introduction, it says, if you're looking for unfiltered commentary, I like how I put that. And I really, <laughs> because I just. Good for you. I just, um, you know, let people live their lives and don't tell me what to do. And uh, it's just amazing to me. That's why I admire you guys. Because you probably get, you've gotten so much grief. I've seen in a couple of interviews, you could tell the look on your face when you're talking about some of the incidents. like, you know, this really is terrible. I'm thinking, why would they bother those people? They're really cool. I mean, leave them alone. I, you know, I'd hang around with them all the time if I lived in the area. But, you know, hey. <laughs> oh, you're very sweet. Yeah. You're very sweet. Uh, well, I but, but I'll, Yeah, coming, coming back to... To Sparks Press, right. a lot of that comes just from my own experiences with the media and seeing how stories get twisted and how things get hyperbolized, how we can say one thing and then it gets completely blown out of oh, proportion. Believe me, I know, because as a council member, I was a Democrat back then, not to bring up politics, but I used to be like old school, like everybody's mm -hmm. equal and do their own thing. And this and that, and I was just, to this day, I'm boycotted by all the leftist progressive groups in the area of my store because I think that everybody should do their own thing and uh, nobody should be above anybody else and nobody should crowd the line in front of anybody else. And I just, they just went after me for years. So yeah. I, I know what that's like. Yeah. And you know, when it's, when it's my own story and my own life that's getting blown out of proportion and turned into hyperbole so that people can make money off of it. I mean, yeah. I, I don't make money off of it, <laughs> but oh, so that other people can make money off of it. It's, it's annoying, but I get to the point where I can laugh at it. When I know that something very similar is happening to big world news that really affects people's lives in a huge way, that gets really scary. I, I think the part, the trouble is, though, and I don't mean this in a bad way. I'm not trying to imply that people are dumb or stupid. But there's a lot of low information people out there that just don't know what's true. Right. It doesn't make them dumb or stupid. It just, they're, they're fed 30-second sound bites, and that's all they really check into. They've never read more than two pages in a row in a day, and that's really sad because some people are making important decisions and they should look at what's really happening, not what they want you to think is happening. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a lot of news is sold to the lowest common denominator yeah. and written for the lowest common denominator. And it was back in the 19th century, too. And that's what Felix is working hard to fight in Sparks Press. Yeah, I can't wait they, to I can't wait to read it cuz I like Felix. He's a cool guy. Aw, thanks. I'm yeah, glad. He's, he's a, you I, like I like him. I like all the characters actually, but uh but uh like I said, uh Kitty's my personal favorite. I like Eddie, oh. maybe suck. <laughs> a lot of Kitty comes from a book written by a woman called Amelie Reeves, who is she was quite famous in her day, but she's been largely forgotten. And she wrote a book called The Quicker the Dead that was a book about a young widow and right. her conflicts 
in falling in love again, but being very worried about that because she's yeah. feeling very conflicted because she did promise till death do us part. Right. And so a lot of Kitty's character comes out of ideas I got from this older novel. Right, right. And that's been that's been interesting to explore. And then when I continued the series, I realized that someone in Kitty's position who was someone who'd been widowed that young would want children. And so then that dictated the story arc right. of her and Doc. Now, I know, in, I know how you, you talk about subjects that are you know, not taboo, but, but you handle them so subtly and so beautifully. In other words, she was just starting to understand her sexuality when her husband died. That's a great way to put it. It's not vulgar. It's not bad. It's just really nice. And, it's, and, and it makes the point without being interrogatory. Yeah, well, thank you. I try to be respectful of my characters because... After a while, they, they do feel alive to me. They do feel like right. friends to me. And so I want to respect them just like I would respect any other friends. Well, I encourage everybody. Uh, I'm going to put this out on YouTube, and there's a couple of podcast um, uh, speaker and a couple I'm going to put them on. I encourage everyone, and I'll leave links in the description on YouTube for the links for your books, and I, I encourage everybody to read them. And it's, 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 not, it's a story about people, but it's also a story about the era and how people handled things, how people handled change, how people handled tragedy, how people, you know, uh, love interactions. And it, it's, it's fascinating stuff. And it's oddly enough, it's Victorian times, but it's very timely topics at the same time. Aw, well, thank you. I thought it was I'm really glad you enjoyed it so yeah. much. And, uh, oh, boys, <laughs> it's been really great talking to you. How's Gabriel? Oh, he's well. He's well. He's uh, He's been enjoying uh, work. He is working at a library. Right. He's a librarian. And, <clears throat> excuse me, today's his day off. He is helping out at a local bike shop because oh, okay. there's been a lot, of, a lot of challenges for people these days. Yeah, and so he's just I'll bet. Helping out the owner of that shop to to make things go through because oh. he's got a lot of experience with oh. bicycles. There you are. I see you on the video now. I've been looking, yeah. staring at the microphone, and I see you now. So, but uh, <laughs> God, it, it's I, I'm I'm really really glad we talked, and I got a lot out of it. And uh, I'm a big admirer. I'm a huge fan of yours. Not so much the nonfiction, but the fiction books, the series, the Tales of Chesham Oak. I I've read a couple of them twice. I got to tell the truth here, but. Uh, did you think of anything else maybe concerning the books you'd like to touch on that we haven't talked about? Well, something that I always like to put in a plug for anytime I'm, I'm allowed to sure. is that I think it's really important for everyone to read as much as they can, to read yeah. as many books as they can. I mean, because, actual physical books, not online Kindle. Absolutely. And it's interesting because there have been a lot of studies done that the human brain actually interacts differently with physical books than with things on a screen. Yeah, you mentioned that in one of your videos uh, about reading help. Yeah, it's actually a different part of the brain that's at work. And there have been scientific studies done into this, which is just really fascinating. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I, I'm it's concerned all in about a physical space. Yeah, younger people I'm concerned with because now they're doing it on tablets and on Kindles and they don't have any physical books. Right. Now, a physical book has a front, a back, a top, and a bottom. Yeah. It's a three-dimensional thing. And as we read it, our brains are actually mapping out the place in the book where we found the most important information. Just like when you're walking through your town, you're mapping out right. unconsciously, you're mapping out the important landmarks. Like you see a map online, you see a physical map. Brain mm -hmm. reacts much yeah, differently. Yeah, it's, it's different. And so... To come back to the idea that everyone should be reading more. When I was a little girl, I used to go to the library every single day after school, and there was a poster with a poem on it. And I'll never forget that poem. It said, the more you read, the more you know. The more you know, the smarter you grow. Right. The smarter you grow, the louder your voice when speaking your mind or making your choice. Yeah, but I remember you said that in one of your episodes. Yeah, and that's so true as well. Absolutely. Um, what was the so I think everyone yeah. needs to be reading more so that they have a louder voice when they speak their mind well, and, yeah. so that they, and so that they make more informed choices well, about everything it, in their it, life. It's funny how it affects culture because I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Mary Steenburgen where H.G. Wells comes in the present time, and I think it was the 1970s or 80s, and he's in the apartment with her you know, on a dinner date. And he looks around and he says, where are your books? 
<laughs> he's supposed to be H.G. Wells from, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the previous century. She goes, well, I don't have that many. He goes, wow. And he, that's the first thing he noticed. Where are all your books? <laughs> well, so many literacy campaigns these days are just focused on children and getting in basic literacy. But I think it's terribly important for adults to be reading as much as they can as well. And there are plenty of adults out there who will say, oh, I don't have time to read. But if that automatically popped into their head when they're hearing this, I would challenge themselves them to be very honest with themselves about yeah. how much time they spend online, how much time they spend watching TV, how much yeah. time they spend on all these electronic gizmos yep. and asking themselves, what is the best use of their precious life? I heard, uh, I heard somebody say once, that's the curse of intelligence is boredom. <laughs> yes. And uh, yeah, I, I think, uh, I think it's going to go back. I think some of the older ways of doing things are going to slowly come back for the next generation. I'm very encouraged in that, actually. A lot of people aren't, but I am, because mm -hmm. I see that they're going to see this is empty stuff. To mm -hmm. There's an old saying, send not for a hatchet to break open an egg. Right. And yeah. the reason for that is that sometimes the simplest ways are the most effective. I, I used to use it in politics when I was a councilman. There would be a piece of legislation, and I would say, you know, you guys are cooking a marshmallow with a flamethrower. I'm like, this is a little bit overkill, isn't it? I mean, and they would look at me like, what? You know, it's, it's interesting. Same thing, though. Yeah, same idea. Yeah. Same idea. Well, I, I'll tell you, I, I'm delighted that we talked. I'm a big fan of yours, always have been. I encourage everybody. I'll leave links in the description on the YouTube channel, of course, on the podcast channels. You can't, but, but uh, I, I'm absolutely delighted that we talked. I had a Aw, well, thank you so much. It's been a delight for me as well. Yeah, and I know. thank you for this opportunity. And I just want to say best of luck in all your projects and to all your listeners out there, best of luck in all. All of their projects. Yeah, you as well. And I want to say that anytime you want to come back, you have an open invite, feel free to email me and we can sit down anytime you want to and just shoot the breeze if you want. I'd be delighted. Thank you so much. Well